Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today I want to talk a little bit about some uh, sort of thermal testing theory stuff, uh, mostly focusing on thermal paste, though it is technically uh, applicable to all kinds of uh, thermal testing, it's just that with thermal paste it, it makes the most sense, because, um, well, it works everywhere, but basically the, the, the idea that when you want to really test any kind of cooling system, you have to test it at as high of a heat load as you can possibly manage because um, physics. So let, let's get into it, right? So first of all, we're just going to take a, an example of thermal paste because basically what inspired this video is that I, earlier today I was messing around with my 290X matrix, which was really a couple minutes of ago, and I was just having some thermal issues and I swapped thermal paste and I saw a huge temperature drop that kind of surprised me. And then I was like, well makes sense um makes sense so first we have four watts so first we'll have like a four watts per meter kelvin thermal paste this is a pretty normal uh, rating for a generic standard you know thermal paste that you might use then we'll go with eight watts and i'm going in increments of like four eight sixteen because it's convenient not because it's necessarily the most realistic though eight watts per meter kelvin is a thing you can actually get as a thermal paste you can buy this kind of stuff and then at the top end, we'll have 16 watts per meter Kelvin, which is an awkward value because any kind of liquid metal compound will actually be significantly better than this. And any kind of uh, regular thermal paste will actually be under this. So th this is not a real thermal paste value you can buy, but I think you can get thermal pads in this spec. Um, so that's kind of fun, but it's not a thermal paste spec. So if we want to compare our four thermal pastes here with drastically, like this thermal paste is four times more thermally conductive than this thermal paste. If we want to test this, and we're, we're just gonna assume like with thermal paste, another thing you need to keep in mind is depending on uh, how the thermal paste actually spreads out when you apply a heat sink, uh, a thermal paste that after compression is four times thinner than another thermal paste. Like if, if our four, like if this, this paste over here compresses down to say 0 0.1, like 0, 0, 001 millimeter, Right. I don't know what an actual thermal paste compresses down to. I, I don't really care about this, but just going to point this out. Um, that would potentially make up for the different. Like if this was 0 0.04, then uh, these would actually be equivalent because this one's four times thicker and this one's like this one's four times thinner and four times less conductive. But it, it has to tra like the heat has to travel through a layer of thermal paste. That's one fourth the height of this layer of thermal paste. So that's kind of something to keep in mind with thermal pads. If if you're buying a thermal pad and it's just like real, like really, really thick, um, it's probably really crap. Like it's not going to get a lot of cooling done because it's really thick, even if it has a really high conductivity rating um, compared to a thermal pad. Like if you have a thermal pad that's half as thick and then only like 60% of the, the thermal conductivity, that's actually better than a thermal pad that, you know, you, you get the idea, right? So anyway, so, but we're going to just ignore this with thermal pastes here. We're just going to assume all of our thermal pastes spread out the same, um, right? So we're, and, and that they all respond the same way to the same amount of mounting pressure. Even then, um, there's a way we can potentially make our thermal paste look better or worse, depending on how we test. Um, or more like we can make the difference between this paste, this paste, and this paste look bigger or smaller depending on how we test our thermal paste. So, so let's throw up a graph here. Um, so this is going to be really great uh, graph. There we go. And now we're going to go. And so we're going to have degrees here. Right. So temperature difference. Uh, so actually we're just going to go delta T in uh, Celsius. Bam. Uh, and then here we're going to have heat load, right? And we're, we're just going to ignore some physical things like how much surface area this heat is spread over and all, all that jazz. We're, we're just going to ignore that, okay? We're, we're going to simplify this down to like uh, too simple, far too simple. But uh, we're, we're still going to do it because the, like it still makes sense what I'm going to get at. So mark that out. So we have one, two, three four, five, six. Uh, you know what? Let's go all the way up to seven degrees, right? And then we have our midpoints here. So that's half a degree there. And I also have, of course, a quarter degree because we do have a thermal paste that's four times as good as one of the other ones. So I'm really scaling all of my values here to be convenient, right? 
Um, so let's let's take our first heat load, okay? So our first heat load, we're just gonna say is gonna be four watts uh, per meter. We're, we're just gonna say four watts, okay? And so we're, we're just gonna say, okay, so our four watt uh, per meter Kelvin thermal paste, we're, we're gonna have that as a dot, we're gonna have this one as an X, and we're gonna have this one as a star. Okay, and that I've just realized that's not going to work. So we're, we're going to have this one as a plus there. X's and pluses and dots. Perfect. Um, that's going to work. So, I think. So, our first thermal paste, right, our 4-watt thermal paste, that one's going to end up here. Our 8 watts per meter Kelvin thermal paste is going to be here. And then our best thermal paste is going to be right there. And so if you look at this, right, the temperature difference between these two is 0 0.25 degrees. For a lot of test setups, this is margin of error. So right here, you would conclude there's no difference between these two thermal pastes. For this right here, and, and then, you know, this gap right here, that's still 0 0.5 degrees. You would still say, you know what, that's margin of error. There is no difference between any of these pastes. They perform exactly the same. What's the point of buying the really expensive one? And this is wrong because the really expensive one is a lot, lot better than the, the four watt per meter Kelvin one, um, except you've just tested it in a scenario where it literally doesn't matter what your thermal paste is because you're at very low heat output. Now, if we double our heat output and change no other parameters in our test setup, so we go up to eight watts, which really I shouldn't have units down here, we should just go wham there. So if we go up to eight watts instead of four, what's going to happen is our 4 watts per meter Kelvin paste will end up here. But our uh, 8 watts per meter Kelvin paste will end up there, and our plus paste will end up here, the 16 watt, right? So what you're going to notice is that it's not like the, the scaling of the thermal paste is very different. So when we go up to 12 watts over here, right, our cheap uh, 4 watt paste is going to go all the way up to there, and at this point, like, the difference starts getting bigger. That's the main point, right? Our 8-watt paste is going to be over here, and our very expensive paste is going to be there, right? Because by the time we get to 16, right, so that's going to be our 16 watts, our very expensive paste finally is 1 degree delta, right? Our cheap paste is now all the way at 4, um... And our uh, really, like, our mid-range paste is going to be, ha like, at, uh, at a 2 right there, right? So what you can see here is that you basically get, um, which I'm going to enable the lock-ons. Yeah, lock-ons enabled. So, you know, we, we can clearly see the, the kind of scaling one of our pastes has right here, right, is like that. And then if we look at the scaling of our really expensive paste, that one scales a lot better. Like that, right? And then our really, really cheap paste, well, that one just goes straight to hell. <laughs> um, like so, right? So by the time you get to a really high heat load, like at this point, right, if you're testing something that's hot enough, this is a big difference, right? Like... That, that's a, that is a significant difference right here in performance. And this right here is just like, that, that's not even uh, accept, like, that's not even remote, like, that's not margin of error anymore, right? Um, so this is something to keep in mind with any kind of thermal testing. And so uh, the reason why I did this with thermal paste is that thermal paste is actually linear in, mo well, in theory, thermal paste should be relatively linear in terms of its thermal conductivity. So you throw twice as much heat at a layer of thermal paste, the temperature delta across it is going to be twice as large. Um, but if you were to apply this kind of testing theory, this kind of same idea to, say, a air cooler, um, this actually, this kind of scaling is actually not true at all, because air coolers use heat pipes heat pipes thermally saturate, and so they actually get non-linear temperature, uh, they, they have non-linear performance um, once you get into really, really high wattages. So, like, here we're seeing that, okay, so our thermal paste are just going up and up and up, nice and linear. And with an air cooler, what you would actually see would be something more like, uh, uh, well, would be something that looks more like, say, this. 
you just reach a point where the the heat pipe is overloaded and the temperature just shoots upwards and you can't really remove any more heat um and the reason why this is important is if you're doing like if you're looking at any kind of thermal test it's really important that they tested a very high heat load because if you test a bunch of different air coolers or a bunch of different thermal paste materials on a 100 watt heat load, it's going to be a very different picture from a 200 watt heat load or a 300 watt heat load or a 400 watt heat load. Because on the 400 watt heat load, if you're testing something that has linear thermal performance, it's going to be literally like the gap between all of the things tested will be four times larger. Okay. Um, and at the same time, you also do need to consider surface area. So especially with like a thermal paste so if we and i'm actually not sure what the specifics of why this works is for thermal physics but if we had a square this size right um nope that's not what i wanted i wanted to zoom out there um so if we have a square that size and it puts out 100 watts of heat and then we have a square that's this size Right, and we're just going to assume that there's no cooling bottleneck on the other side of the... Oh, wait, that's too big. Um, we have a square this size, right, and we're going to assume that our cooling capacity on the other side of the... Like, our heatsink is infinite. Our heatsink can dissipate whatever you throw at it. It's perfect heatsink. It, it'll dissipate everything. Well, this square right here, um, that can do 400 watts that's equivalent because your thermal density is is the same now if this right here this little square was 200 watts um this is suddenly hellfire for your thermal paste which is why um you'll see a lot of people t like a lot of uh place like I, even i'll say it um you don't use uh liquid metal on uh, gpus but you do use liquid metal under the ihs of say a 8700k or an 8086k or a 7700k and the reason why you would use liquid metal under the ihs of an intel cpu and not necessarily on your gpu is not because the gpu pulls significantly less power but because a gpu's die is you know like uh yeah like a a, a 290x die next to a uh you know, 99, like, uh, uh, well, yeah, next to, like, an 8086K is something that looks like this. Like, the, the di GPU dies are freaking gigantic next to CPUs. Like, GPUs regularly have dies in the, you know, 200 to 6 or even 700 millimeters square. And the largest CPU for, like, in, like H Intel HEDT is a 5, I think is around 500 millimeters square. So GPUs are absolutely gigantic. And that's why there's like that's why it doesn't make a lot of sense to use liquid metal on a GPU, because the thermal density is very, very low. But it makes perfect sense to throw liquid metal on a 7700 k because the thermal the thermal density of a 7700 k is stupid high. So your thermal paste has to be working overtime because the cross section of thermal paste that you're actually trying to push heat through is much, much smaller. Right, so that that's something to uh, to keep in mind as well. And also, this means that if you're going to be testing a thermal paste, if you put the thermal paste on top of an IHS, it's going to look like the the difference between a bunch of different thermal pastes on top of an IHS is going to be significantly smaller than if you use the thermal paste under the IHS. Right, so that that's just kind of just kind of the intricacies of of uh, thermal testing, say for thermal paste, but it also applies to heat sinks uh, in uh, not quite the same fashion because heat sinks don't really they're not as heavily affected by the uh the whole like surface area that that you're using um heat sinks are more about just absolute heat output um so yeah so like water cooling scales linearly air coolers are non-linear um which uh that's kind of like and the funny thing about that is is that since air coolers are non-linear you can actually run into a situation where an air cooler is just amazing 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 like absolutely crushes any kind of water cooling system and then it just sort of falls right over once you exceed a certain wattage where the heat pipes saturate so yeah i, I figured i'd talk a little bit about this because this is something that you know i see a lot of uh a lot of uh sort of in relatively informal thermal tests done on youtube and they don't, like, consider this at all, right? They'll test, like, a CPU at stock. And a CPU at stock settings 
is a very different beast than a CPU at twice or three times its stock wattage, right? Because at three times your stock wattage, if the temperature difference between the thermal paste was one degree at stock, it is now three mm -hmm. degrees at, at an overclock, okay? Um, and that's still not very significant, but you get the idea. Like, that, that's, that's, a, that's a much larger difference than one degree, right? Like, that's no longer margin of error. That's like the, this thermal paste is just better than this other thermal paste. Um, and similarly, if you have heat sinks, especially air coolers, if you're going to test the air cooler within the wattage range where it works, yeah, it's probably going to just kind of crush everything because heat pipes have a really, really, like, heat pipe thermal conductivity is absolutely ridiculous up until the point where you overload them. At which point they basically become useless because there's no longer, like, the, the way they work does, stops working. Like, literally, that's the main issue is just you are no longer able to get enough fluid, um, uh, I didn't want to go into a heat pipe theory, but basically the, the gist of it with heat pipes is, is if you have a heat pipe like this and we set this end on fire, as long as this is a small fire, um, your water is going to, like, the you're normally going to have water. You can actually get heat pipes filled with all kinds of stuff, but let's just assume it's water. Um, you can also get heat pipes filled with, like, there's cryogenic heat pipes where you'll have, like, liquefied gases in them. Um, and there's also super high temperature heat pipes where you'll have, like, liquid metal like liquid sodium or something running in the heat pipe and you'll boil sodium and it'll condense on the other end of the heat pipe. So anyway, you'll have water in one end and we'll just call it like, we'll assume this is just a gravity fed heat pipe. Real heat pipes have a wick inside of them, which uses capillary forces to, to pull, push the, like pull the water back towards the hot spot. Um, because obviously the hot spot dries out. So capillary action tries to like pull water back there. I don't know the physics behind that. It just works. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Just works. Um, but basically, if you have a gravity-fed heat pipe, right, you're, you're going to run into an issue at some point. Well, actually, no. Gravity-fed heat pipes, you won't have an issue until, like, you stop being able to condense water in the, the end of the heat pipe fast enough. But in a, in a heat pipe with a wick, um, you basically run into the issue that the water can't travel back to the heat source fast enough. And so you'll basically start, like, this will like this will all boil away, right? So there'll be no water, and you'll just have a bunch of steam sitting inside the heat pipe. And if the heat pipe is full of steam and no more water is being boiled, that means no more heat is being removed by the heat pipe. Um, and if you keep actually heating a heat pipe at that point, you can actually, like, if you heat it long enough, you'll eventually get it to, like, explode. Um, though normally what will happen with a real world CPU is that the CPU will thermal throttle once the, once the heat pipes are saturated because, uh, it'll very quickly end up overheating af after the, the heat pipes max out. So, yeah, um, just thermal testing things, um, that were supposed to be only about thermal paste, but, uh, ended up being about kind of everything. So, yeah, like, just because something performs really well at 100 watts does not mean it will perform equally well at 200 watts, or 400 watts, or 600, or 8, you get the idea, right? Um, so, yeah, hopefully this was somewhat useful to everybody, um, and, uh, yeah, that's it for the video, thanks for watching, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below, um, and if you're wondering about that heat pipe thing, I can link, like, a data sheet from a heat pipe manufacturer talking about this, um, if you want more detail on that, um, it, it's interesting reading. It's just not interesting enough <laughs> for me <laughs> to, to like memorize, but, um, yeah. So where was I? Right. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. I have Teespring. If you'd like to buy like Teespring is full of merch. Patreon is for people who don't like merch. So there, you can just support me directly through Patreon every month, or you can you can go to Teespring, buy a shirt, buy socks, buy stickers, buy posters. Um, oh yeah, and uh, people who uh, who uh, support AHOC through Patreon get access to the AHOC Discord, which gives you access to some extra videos that I think are just really really bad. But a lot of the people on the Discord would beg to differ. And the, you also get access to some videos in advance of everybody else. Because uh, if I pre-record videos, I, I, I don't like withholding information, but it's just like some, like you can't just dump six videos in one day on YouTube. YouTube would get very pissed if you did that. So yeah, um, patrons get access to that as well. Um, 
anyway, thanks for watching and uh, goodbye.